Okay, so let's start. Uh, welcome everybody to another of these uh, IFAR course seminars. Today, I have a pleasure to introduce uh, the Professor Yves Rebats from the APFL in Switzerland. Uh, Yves is uh, an expert on simulations of uh, dwarf, dwarf galaxies. He uh, did his PhD in uh, Switzerland under the supervision of Pro Professor Pinninger. And after successfully presenting his PhD, he moved to the Paris Observatory in a postdoc to work in the Lerma Laboratory uh, under the supervision of uh, friend, Professor Francois Combs. Uh, and there he worked on, on the cooling flows uh, inside the galaxy clusters. Also joined it uh, in the APFL in 2007, that is the same place in where he did the PhD. And there he became the, the professor and is basically uh, collaborating with Pascal Jablonka, developing, for example, one of the first things and important things to it is the, to develop a new hemodynamical code that is called GEAR, is based on the, on the gadget uh, code. And currently he mostly uh, does research on the dwarf spheroidal galaxies and how they are linked on the cosmology. And also uh, working uh, being one of the uh, strongest and more active collaborators of the of the Aurora project. So um, thank you a lot, Yves, for, for coming. Uh, today, I think you will talk about these projects about the dwarf uh, galaxies, simulated dwarf galaxies. So again, thank you for accepting the invitation. And as soon as you want, you, you can start. And if you want to add something else in your CV, I, I did a very short uh, summary. <laughs> you, please proceed. <laughs> thank you. Yes. Thank you, Fenty, for the, the kind introduction. Maybe I, I just need to mention that I'm not a professor. The, the, there is a, the, the other title is MER, Maître d'enseignement and de recherche. But anyway, that's, that's how it is. OK. Um, good. Can you, can you all hear me well? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. So indeed, so the, the goal of, of today's work is to, to, um, to talk about dwarf galaxies and um, mainly trying to connect dwarf galaxies with simulated dwarf galaxies. So uh, let me just start by uh, thanking all the collaborators I have for, the, I have for the, the different part I will present in this, in this talk. So as uh, Santi mentioned, I'm collaborating since years with uh, Pascal Jablonka at EPFL. At EPFL, we have also the participation of different PhD students, like Ozaman, Masasanati, Mladen, Ivkovic. We have a master student who contributed a lot those last, last month, Fabien Jean Cartier. Uh, Jennifer Schober is a postdoc, uh, also at EPFL. We have external collaborator, David Harvey in Leiden, Kersin Kuzde in Salamanca, and uh, Giuseppe, Giuseppina Batagli and Salvador Cardona Barrero. Uh, in Tenerife, so Spanish collaborators. Good. So let me start this seminar by uh, first uh, provi providing you with my own definition of, of uh, dwarf galaxies. So in fact, 20 years ago, dwarf galaxies were among the most boring objects um, populating our universe. <clears throat> but nowadays, they are among the most powerful objects to understand uh, the, the universe. And I hope at the end of this talk, you will be convinced that this is indeed the case. So um, the ad outlines of today's talk is the following. So I will take a few minutes to introduce in depth what more precisely what dwarf galaxies are. In particular, I will focus on uh, local group dwarf galaxies. And I will um, show you why dwarf galaxies are very interesting and why it's really timely to study them. Then I will spend a um, large uh, part on uh, describing how people and how our own group is uh, simulated dwarf galaxies, in particular in a cosmological context, how we can reproduce the different observation we have at our disposal. And I will also uh, talk about the remaining challenges. That's uh, what I think something very important. Then I wanted to dedicate a few slides to two recent projects. So the first one is to try to connect dwarf galaxies with the first population of stars, pop three stars, and see how they may maybe help to um, understand the shape of the metallicity luminosity function in the um, dwarf regime. And I will end by by very um, nice work, which show that dwarf galaxies may also be used to 
constrained, the cosmology in particular constrained the possibility of having primordial magnetic fields um, in the during the inflation. Okay, good. So dwarf galaxies. So of course you probably all know that dwarf galaxies are the smallest, but also the faintest dark, uh, galaxies that populate our universe. But they are also, according to observations, but also to lambda CDM prediction, they are the most abundant ones. And uh, this is illustrated here by this the luminosity function derived by the gamma experiment. So roughly the, the density or the number of, of um, galaxies as a function of the uh, magnitude. And you see that the, the largest number of uh, galaxies in the faint end so it is the, the, the faintest systems. The, the dwarf galaxy I will describe in this talk uh, have luminosities which is nearly zero, which is in fact, well, it, it's few um, tens of few hundred of solar and luminosities. Um, and the maximum will be something around 10 to the 8. So this is um, the kind of object we find uh, in around the, the Milky Way and in the local group. Around the Milky Way, in fact, dwarf galaxies are known since nearly, nearly 80 years with the discovery in the 40s of Scriptor and Fornax. And uh, as you can see in this plot, we, where you sh we have the um, the number of, of observed dwarf galaxies in, the, in uh, the Milky Way as a function of the time. So this is a nice plot taken from, from the review of uh, Josh Simon. We, we see that until 2000, there were only 12 dwarf galaxies known. It's only after 2000, thanks to digital, a, a different, um, it's a digital survey experiment that this, this number strongly increased and it reaches nearly 60. So we have now about 60 dwarf galaxies that have been identified um, orbiting around the Milky Way. <clears throat> In the local group, this number increased up to 130. And those uh, dwarf galaxies are usually clusters around bigger galaxies. And this is what you can see here in the sketch. You have the Andromeda galaxy with plenty of, of um, dwarf galaxies around. And this is uh, our own Milky Way, again, with its whole family of dwarf galaxies. I have a movie that illustrates that. I don't see if it's more or less OK. But at the center, you see the Milky Way with all, um, all dwarf galaxies around. And here on the right now, with the Andromeda galaxy. So this is just to give you an idea of where those dwarf galaxies are found. Good, let's have a very quick look at what those dwarf galaxies look like. So this is NGC 6822, one of the brightest dwarf galaxies. Uh, you see it is more or less uh, spherical with some um, blue region indicating star formation there. So these galaxies still have gas. This is a uh, Fornax. Uh, around the galaxy found so around the, the Milky Way. Here and you see indeed that this object seems to be a bit more boring. There is no longer gas, no star formation going on here. It's quite faint. And I like Carina in particular because here you see all the stars you see in this picture uh, don't really belong to, Car to Carina. They are part of, they are four grand stars uh, of our Milky Way. So this image tell you how difficult it is to find these objects because they are quite diffuse and faint. This, this point is even better illustrated by, by uh, this picture. So this is a, a picture of Recticulum 2, an ultra faint dwarf galaxy. So a, ga a dwarf galaxy with, by definition, a luminosity which is less than 10 to the 5 solar luminosity. And again, is what you see if you keep the stars from the Milky Way, and this is now the, the stars that only belong to Reticulum. So you see that, <clears throat> again, um, it's really, really, it tells you how difficult it is to find uh, ultra faint dwarf galaxies in the Milky Way, because you have to disentangle between um, stars that really belong to the object and stars from, from the Milky Way. Okay, those, those ultra faint dwarf, by the way, may be quite compact. This one has a typical size of only 30 parsecs, so very small object. And there is now another overlap between <coughs> both, <coughs> both in terms of luminosity um, and size. 
between um, globular clusters and <coughs> ultra thin dwarf galaxies. So it's not always easy to disentangle between the two. Now, why was it so? Um, why dwarf galaxies are so interesting, and why it is very timely to study them now? The the first uh, argument for that is definitely because now they are very well constrained by observations. And I will try to explain you what we know about these objects. So we know since twenty years that there exists nice um, correlation between different. What I would call global quantities. By global quantities, I mean the total luminosity, the velocity, the solar velocity. Uh, <coughs> sorry, the solar velocity dispersion, uh, the the mean metallicity, their size, and so on and so forth. And so it's known that they have they exist correlation, like for a brighter galaxy. For example, luminosity scale as a function of the velocity dispersion, which makes sense. The metallicity is also increasing if we increase the luminosity of the subject, and the size also slightly increased. The correlation is a bit as good here. Okay, that's something which is well known since <clears throat> 20 years. But those, those recent years, um, we have accumulated a huge number of much more detailed and accurate information. In particular, we have access to um, spectra of individual stars in these objects, and that's really fantastic because now we are we have a good we have ways to to understand exactly what is the the chemical the the atomic content of uh, of stars the, the ratio between different um, elements in single stars, and that's super useful to uh, to understand how the chemical evolution proceeds in these models and also derive information on the star formation histories of, of those dwarf fundamentals. So let me illustrate this point with this plot taken from the review of Elin Tulsa in 2009. So you have here the alpha uh, abundances traced by magnesium and calcium as a function of the iron here for different set of dwarf galaxies. Let's focus maybe on, on sculptor, the green points here. What we see here is that the, the metal poor stars are usually, usually aligned here, forming a kind of plateau. And with increasing metallicity, you see that those points decreases. And what this tells us, for example, is that uh, sculptor was associated with an extended star formation, which was long enough to let the explosion of supernova of type 1A appear and pollute with a large quantity of iron. So if you add iron there, you see with increasing, increase the metallicity, but you will also decrease the ratio between alpha and lemon and, and iron. So thanks to this measurement, we have a good understanding of the star formation histories of the dwarf. We have access also, because we know the, the metallicity of the stars, we have access to population gradient. It has been shown that there are several graphs that show a metallicity gradient, so metal, Rich uh, stars are usually found in the center, uh, metal core in the outer part. We have also access to the kinematics of the stars, of course, with spectra. And uh, there, there have been some surprising, so for example, we've seen that those objects are much more complex than it was uh, thought previously. Uh, for example, in Scripto, we, we have observed that um, the metal rich stars are usually, well, usually have a a key mnematic which is lower, which is illustrated in this plot here, that's the metal rich stars. Uh, so as a function of the radius here. While if you focus on the metal poor star, you see that in average the, the, the velocity dispersion is larger. So we need to, we definitely need to understand the origin of these features. I wanted to end this slide by um, telling you that since uh, <laughs> two, three years, we have now, thanks to the GADA satellite, we have now access to orbits of um, the majority of dwarf galaxies, uh, which bring new important information. So in, in addition to uh, this, uh, this large sets of observation, dwarf galaxies are very interesting because of course they are also believed to be the first uh, system that form in our universe. And in particular, if you want to understand the epoch of organization, uh, which maybe have been strongly 
dominated by the effect of dwarf galaxy. You first need to understand how dwarf galaxy form and how they evolve during the first billion years. Uh, dwarf galaxies are also strongly dark matter dominated, so there is a direct connection there with the standard model. You can use them to constrain the standard model, or at least to check uh, that the prediction of the standard models is 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 fine, is okay. And you probably know that they have been long-standing problem. I go very quickly here because I will talk about that in more detail later on. Problem like the Kespan core pro um, um, issue, the missing satellite problem, the too big to fail problem. Uh, now we have also the this satellite phase space correlation problem. Um, because they are dark matter dominated, they allow us also to constrain alternatives to the lambda CDN, like for example, warm dark matter, self interacting dark matter. But they also uh, allow us to uh, constrain additional physics that could play a role in lambda CDM. In particular, we talk about primordial magnetic fields. And uh, yeah, a very important thing to, to keep in mind is that those objects, well, we, we think they are living in very small halos, so, halo, so they are a very uh, extremely sensitive. In particular, they are sensitive to feedback process. So if you change a bit the solar feedback or the UV background heating, they will uh, react very strongly. So that they may be used to constrain those poorly known uh, feedback processes. And finally, um, as those objects usually form very few stars, if for some reason you have a peculiar chemical uh, nucleosensitive events that appear into uh, one of these dwarfs, like for example, the explosion of one neutron star that will be bring a lot of air process elements, uh, you, will have a, you will have a high probability of, of still of keeping a trace of these events compared to a larger system where everything will be diluted. So there are very interesting test beds for chemical evolution. Good, so let me now talk about how we can simulate dwarf galaxies and in particular, how we can simulate them in a cosmological context. So I decided to start this part by providing you with, with a list of uh, several simulations that have been performed focusing in particular on uh, dwarf galaxies. And I, we can split uh, this simulation in two groups. The first group, which are usually zoom in, of zoom in simulation of um, a Milky Way-like system or a local group system. So you simulate a complete environment and satellites, well, uh, dwarf galaxies appear as a kind of byproduct of these, these simulations. And the other group is, of course, uh, simulation which focusing directly on dwarf galaxies. So you perform zoom in simulation. I will explain a little bit in more detail what are zoom in simulations. But you zoom in, in a region of the universe <clears throat> where you know where, um, that you will form dwarf galaxies. Um, so those simulations focus more in what we could say we could call field galaxies. So, um, of course, those two uh, group of, of simulation have the advantage of this advantage. For example, the, <clears throat> the first group, of course, this, this demand a huge amount of CPU time because you need to, to compute the full animal, uh, environment. Of course, the interest of doing this kind of simulation is that you have access to the complete population, so you can um, predict, for example, the distribution with respect to the radius of dwarf galaxies, for example, or you directly take into account the interaction of those dwarf galaxies with the, the host galaxy. The, 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 the drawback of this emission is that, well, in addition to the fact that they are super CPU time consuming, is that uh, usually you have a limited resolution and it's, they are much more difficult to analyze. You, you cannot run thousands of those simulations and trying to play with different parameters and see how they impact on the, the dwarf population, for example. On the contrary, the advantage of this uh, simulation that focus on individual dwarf galaxies that you can run a huge number of them, they are much less uh, CPU demanding. Um, uh, you can, of course, reach a much higher resolution. The analysis is much uh, easier to perform, so you better you can better understand really what's going on in these objects. Of course, the drawback is that you are missing totally the interaction with, between the, the guys. Anyway, this is the, well, we, our group focus on this kind of, of simulations. I, I will now present you 
uh, different simulation we performed some, some years ago. So the idea there were, was to perform so the zoom-in simulation, which is illustrated here. In fact, the, the, the idea of the zoom is to indeed uh, focus on, well, um, have a high resolution in the region that, that will end up in the, in, the, in the draft galaxy. We simulated a box, um, a cosmological box, which is quite tiny in order to have a, a high resolution, which was, by the way, uh, 1,000 solar luminosity. So the box size is, is quite small. It's 3.4 uh, mega parsec cube. And we run 66 simulation, pulling the evolution down to a redshift of zero. So the code we used for that uh, is our own code gear, which is an evolution of a get it to. So it, it used. So it's an SPH method, so particles. Um, it uses, uh, of course, it, it takes in, into account the gravity, the hydrodynamics, but we implemented that with um, a full treatment of the gas cooling, but also the gas heating due to the UV um, radiate, UV background heating thing, so UV radiation. Uh, from the, the gas, we form stars, so we have a big heated star formation recipes. More importantly for us was the fact that we take a lot of time by implementing a full and quite complex evo uh, chemical evolution scheme, so, uh, which take into account the pollution by both the supernova 1 and, and 2, 1A and 2. And I wanted to dedicate one slide on this because I think this is quite important, in particular when we are studying um, faint galaxies with few stars. So the way we are performing our chemical evolution scheme is the following. To start from a gas particle that simulates um, molecular ga gas. At some point, you turn this gas particle into one stellar particle or, or several stellar particles that are called single stellar populations. And then you follow the evolution of the stars. And at every time step, relying on a relation between the lifetime of stars as a function of the mass, of the star mass, you know precisely which kind, what, what is the mass of your star that will explode in one time step? Then you combine that with an IMF, and thanks to the IMF, you know precisely what is the number of stars with a given amount of, of uh, with a, a certain mass that will explode. And then we do things very accurately for all this exploding mass according to the mass three, knowing exactly the, the the quantity, the, the, the type of, of stars with a given uh, mass, we explode um, the correct energy as well as the, the quantity of, of, uh, of yields that are then uh, mass dependent, of course. And then we eject all this into the, um, the ISM. Good. Uh, this is a very uh, quick uh, movie just telling you that gear is not only used to simulate drop galaxies, so as Santi said we are part of the Agora simulation project where we compare our results with uh, the results of other team. And um, so I can tell you that GIA is, is, um, is able to simulate um, spread galaxies as well, as good as other um, famous uh, code. Okay, let me now show you the evolution of one of our uh, dwarf galaxies in cosmological context. On the right of the screen, you see the refined regions, the red, part, the, the red part corresponds to the dark matter. You see that inside you have a tiny object. This is our dwarf uh, system. On the left, you see it now without the dark matter. You see the gas in blue, which precipitates due to the continuous feedback of the stars that are uh, in yellow here. And at, at the end of the day, you end up with a nice uh, dwarf galaxy, which is embedded in a large uh, dark halo, which is now seen here again with these uh, red colors. Okay, good. So let's now, uh, what, what, once you have this, um, have come from large number of, of zoom in simulation dwarf galaxies, the first thing you are interesting to do is to try to see if they fit the scaling relations. And this is what is shown here in this slide. The black point corresponds to observations from galaxies, dwarf galaxies in the Lacat group, and the blue point correspond to our own simulation. You see that the, the relations are very nicely reproduced. So that's, for example, the V-band luminosity as a function of the velocity dispersion. 
And uh, here that's the metallicity, here that the, the half-life radius, so as a function of the luminosity. So everything is, is, is okay as long as we are looking at at global properties. So we can reproduce the scaling relation up to four or order of magnitude. But of course, what was interesting for us is to go much beyond that and looking at more detailed properties like star formation histories, like metallicity distribution function, like a velocity dispersion profile, abundances, and so on and so forth. And doing that, we've understood that uh, we can split roughly the, the dwarf galaxies in three categories. If you look um, at the faintest systems, which are shown here, uh, you understand that in fact the major all all these systems exhibit a star formation history which is uh, quenched. So we quenched we we sorry we we call the system quenched uh, uh, dwarf galaxies with an extension which is at maximum between two uh, up to sometimes four giga year. And the reason for that is that those systems usually are formed in quite small uh, halos. Um, and when you are suffering from the UV background heating during the epoch of realization, you see that the gas may be expelled out. So the, the potential well is not deep enough to, to keep this, this, this gas there and continue for, from itself. So these systems are simply uh, quenched. So you, with those kind of system, you nicely reproduce for example, Oxa Minor, but also Draco or, or Sexton, which are also um, observed are, are, as quench systems. And you can reproduce nicely the metallicity distribution function. So the blue color here are our uh, models. The, the red is the observations. You can also nicely reproduce the velocity dispersion profile. Again, blue colors are the model and, and the red is the observations. And in addition, we can reproduce the abundances. For example, we see here that we can reproduce the decreasing trend of the magnesium, which is due to a few, a, a slightly elongated star formation history. Two giga years is sufficient to let the pollution of S and 1A occur and decrease the uh, Mg, the, the alpha element ratio. Okay. Now, if you look at intermediate ca cases, so dwarf galaxies with a slightly larger luminosity, we can reproduce Scriptor and Andromeda uh, two systems which exhibit a more extended star formation history. Uh, there you end up with more metallic system. You can still nicely reproduce the metallicity distribution function. This is the one of Scriptor here. Yeah. Uh, we still have the velocity dispersion profile correct and the abundance. Okay. Now, if you go to brighter systems, you see that there is a an important difference there, the model forms stars a real continuous way. So the potential well of this system is deep enough to keep the gas at the center and, and ensure the, the, the form star formation will continue during one a complete Hubble time. Okay. Uh, now, we even try to go um, one step further by looking at a very peculiar feature. I mentioned this earlier, but there are cases where the, the dwarf galaxy exhibit a nice uh, metallicity gradient. And we try to understand how it was possible to create those metallicity gradients. And what we have seen that in a bright system, in, in bright system that form stars quite efficiently, like in Andromeda 2, uh, we see that as long as you form stars, so here you see the star formation as, as a function of time. And on top of it, the blue curve show the slope of the gradient. So we see that as long as you we are forming stars, we are increasing the slope of the metallicity gradient, well, decreasing because it's negative. So for bright system, we definitely expect um, a redshift of zero metallicity gradient. And this is indeed what we observed here. However, if you focus on a quench system like Ursa Minor, for example, see that we are forming gradients only during the period where we form stars. And once we cease forming stars, the gradient either stay at the low level or it may disappear. And this is what happened here in this model. So at the end of the day, you no longer have any model. That's quite nicely fits observation. So this is now observation of the Andromeda 2 galaxy. And that's the minor model. So we can recover the gradients observed in these galaxies, for example. 
Uh, we can also reproduce um, the kinematic distinct stellar population. The fact that, well, if we now focus on the um, metallicity of the star, we see that the metal pore systems in red here exhibit usually a, a larger velocity dispersion compared to the blue one. And this trend is very clear for, um, for luminous system. It is much less for uh, for faint system where the population are probably uh, mixed. Okay. Now I wanted to end this part showing you a, a very recent results um, where we have been able to even reproduce prolate rotations. So prolate rotation are seen in two dwarf galaxies, in the local group, so Phoenix and Andromeda 2. And prolate rotation is, is this very peculiar feature. Some dwarf galaxies uh, show their stellar content to be elongated along a given axis here, given by this arrow, you see that the rotation is around this axis. This is why we call correlate rotation. Phoenix is one of these systems. If you observe Phoenix, you see that on the right of this axis, you see stars co uh, moving towards uh, you along the line of, of sign and on the opposite direction on the left there. So you, you, you clearly see the rotation. So we have been able to reproduce the, this very, very peculiar feature uh, due to uh, thanks to the merger of two rather bright galaxies. And this is what we obtained in, in here. So before the merger, we see that basically the system was um, oblate. So here, in fact, the, the, the position of the observer is such that the angular momentum is always towards the y direction. Yeah? So the system was prolate. This is the what happened during the merger, and this is what happened after the merger. So you turn an oblate rotating system to a prolate rotating uh, system due to the merge. Okay, so uh, what I hope I demonstrate to you is that if you simulate the box of the universe and focus on dwarf galaxies, in fact, um, in the, the lambda cdm framework, you see that you can nicely reproduce um, dwarf galaxies with a very um, surprising degree of details, you, so you have correct uh, metallicity distribution function, you have the correct, uh, you can reproduce specularities like gradient, um, uh, oblate rotation, and so on and so forth. So does it tell us that this is the end of the story, lambda CDN is perfect, we understood everything. Of course, you will know that this is never the case in physics. So there are uh, some uh, challenges. So I decided to group challenges into two groups. So one which is more related to stellar population, and watch another one, well, another group which is more focused on, on the, the properties of the dwarf themselves. So this is some well-known uh, challenges, and I first decided to strike out the, the first, so this, the famous missing satellite problem, because I think, and the, the tendency is to tell that it's no longer a problem. So this problem was the following, if you if you pour from a dark matter only simulation of the Milky Way, for example, you will predict a very large number of dark halos, uh, which is much more, well, this number is much uh, larger than the, the dwarf galaxy you observe now. So this, this was, this was the, the origin of the problem. But now with improving simulation, in particular uh, with the fact that we are now able to um, compute the simulation, including the full bionic physics, we know that the majority of those, those tiny dwarf halos uh, don't form stars. And uh, I wanted to illustrate the fact that this is not no longer a problem with these two plots. That's the um, cumulative number of, predict, uh, of, of dwarf galaxies in, uh, around the Milky Way uh, in a region smaller than 300 kpc in the Milky Way in um, uh, the Andromeda galaxy as a function of the luminosity. The black curve here is the observed values, and the shaded red area are the prediction of the numerical simulation. So that's taken from a paper from Simps, uh, Simpson 2018, that's Arico simulations. <clears throat> and you see that, I mean, in average, this, this works pretty well. And that's our own plot um, where we see, so here the curves are um, um, observation, and this gray area is, is the prediction of our simulation. So we need that there is not a huge uh, the discrepancy. Okay, now there is another, I would say, more interesting problem is the phase 
in the satellite phase space correlation is the fact that dark galaxies are not observed to be distributed isotopically around the Milky Way, but rather seems to be distributed in, in very base um, <clears throat> rotating disks. That's observed around the Milky Way, also around the Andromeda galaxy, and more recently it has been shown that the same trend is observed in uh, Centaurus A. Uh, and that's not really well reproduced by lambda CDM uh, simulations. And finally, I wanted to mention also very recent, I don't know if we, we need to call that challenge, but, but something we don't really understand is the fact that now, thanks to the, the, the Gaia data, we have access to orbits. And uh, apparently, there is an excess of concentration of satellites near the pericenter. While, I mean, you, you know that uh, the satellite should spend most of the, its time around the apocenter. So there is a bias there that we don't really understand. So there is something to do. Now, the, the, the other um, groups um, are related to the structure of the dwarf galaxy itself. So, of course, you've probably all heard about the Kirsten core problem, the fact that dark matter sim simulation predicts the density profile at the center of the galaxy to be cuspy, while there is a tendency to say that it's more a core. At the level of dwarf galaxies, <coughs> we've seen that, in fact, it is super difficult to disentangle between a cusp and a core. Well, this is a highly debated. But what we've done is that using self-interacting dark matter, we've been able to really remove the cusp, to remove uh, uh, dark matter mass at the center, which was forming this cusp. And uh, we compare what uh, our, well, the prediction of the model were um, with system which was still cuspy. And if you look only at observed quantities, it is extremely difficult to disengage between the two. Anyway, uh, there are three remaining, that's my own, in fact, remaining uh, challenges that I will discuss in more detail because they are not uh, well known. One challenge is the fact that uh, there exists dwarf galaxies with very peculiar star formation histories. I show you, in fact, that out of our, our, our own um, models, the, dwarf, the, the star formation was quite boring. Usually, you form a peak, and then the system is quenched. Carina shows, for example, two peaks, one first peak and then a second one. So this is something which is very difficult to understand. So the naive, um, the direct explanation could be that we, we need a merger there, but we try that. It's not easy to, to reproduce this feature. Fornax is also very puzzling in the sense that it displays well, it is dominated by interstellar, by intermediate age stellar population. So there is not a first important peak. And that's very something actually we don't know how to reproduce. Uh, <clears throat> another challenge is the fact that you have systems, quite faint systems, with a luminosity which is then than 10 to the 6, uh, which still have, which are still at redshift of zero, associated with a quite large reservoir of H2 gas. So nearly the same quantity of gas is found in, in the, the same quantity of mass is found in, in gas. That's something we don't understand because all our models, as I explained to you, um, are quenched during the epoch of realization. The gas is blown away. So how can you keep a uh, gas in faint system? So that's something we don't really understand. And this maybe tell us something about the touchiness of, of the um, H1 or H2 gas during the epoch of realization. And the last challenge, the following that uh, if you look at the metallicity luminosity relation, I show you that in fact this uh, relation is quite nicely uh, fitted. If now you look at fainter system, so system which have a luminosity which is less than 10 to the 5, so in the what we call the ultra faint regime, this is what you obtain. So the observation tells you that there is a kind of plateau which is formed there. You never, you never observed a mean metallicity uh, below, I would say, minus 2.5, minus 3, while the, the simulation will tell you that you should. And the reason is, is quite clear here. In fact, you form very few stars there, so you produce very little iron, so you expect the system to be very metal poor. That's quite simple. So that's our own simulation. I would like, I think it's important to emphasize that uh, if you add this prediction from other team, 
we are all suffering the same problem. Okay, at a different level, but uh, all people are under predicting the iron there. So this is a problem we tried to solve during the uh, last um, months, I would say, and uh, uh, we maybe have a solution which is related to the existence, well, to the, the, the impact of the, the population three stars, or the first stars that form in our universe. And we tried to explain you in the following slide how this could work. So what you have to keep in mind is that ultra-faint systems form very few stars. And of course, due to that, if you imagine that, uh, well, they form very, of course, very early on during the universe, if they are the first system that form, they will probably have been formed out of, um, of three stars. Simulations, the simulation we run, that tell us that in fact, uh, among the total quantity of stars that, have, that those systems have formed, in some cases, half of them were population three stars. So this is a really super important quantity of, of stars, of course. So then why pop star could be then important to reconciling this, um, uh, this relation with the observed one? So imagine that we are looking at one dwarf galaxy, uh, which is there when we don't consider pop three stars. Now, if we consider pop three stars, what could happen is that you have a first generation of stars, pop three stars, that could maybe bring an additional quantity of iron, but then those systems, those pop three stars, because they are believed to be mainly dominated by massive stars, they will explode and, and, and disappear, explode as supernova and disappear. So in addition to having a kind of boost in metallicity, you could expect a decrease in the luminosity, of course, because the stars are simply gone. It means that you could imagine that you will move this, this tail here, maybe there, maybe reconciling with the observation. So in, in order to test that, uh, we supplemented gear with the possibility of treating uh, pop two and pop three stars. So the real, rule we adopted is simply that you form, well, in metal core stars with the metallicity below minus five, you form pop three stars. And then when you reach minus five, you form, you, you, you create pop two stars. It's important to, to discuss quickly the yields that we use. This is the iron yield, so the, the total ejected mass as a function of the progenitor mass. And this is the curve we used for the pop two a population taken from uh, the very nice review from Nomoto and Kobayashi. And this is what you use for the pop tree. This is the prediction. So you see that up to a mass of nearly 140 solar masses, you don't really increase much in terms of iron, but surely you have a huge boost here. And this is due to, <clears throat> to supermassive stars. So mass stars with a mass which is larger than 140 solar masses, which suffer so-called pair instability and um, they will completely explode. So including the core, the iron core. So it means they will eject a large quantity of iron in the interstellar medium. And you will see that it will play a very important um, role. Okay, so we, we re-simulated our simulation, but now as a venue taking into account pop two and pop three stars, and there we tested different uh, IMF or pop three stars. Uh, I think it's important to stress that they are all top heavy IMF. So we consider only stars with a mass which is larger than 10. So they will, all our star will explode as, as supernova. So um, what we directly see here is that in fact, we move from this state there to as it was more or less expected to a dwarf galaxy that are now more metal rich. And this is really the impact of, of the pair instability for so the, the, the really massive stars that bring in fact up to 20 to 60 times more iron compared to um, assuming a normal, I would say, I, uh, Krupa iron, for example. Okay, by the way, we checked that this is the, indeed the impact of pair instability by re-simulating the same simulation, but now no longer considering pair instability. So we, we simply apply a cutoff in the IMF, and we see that uh, now pop two stars are pop three stars are no longer sufficient because we are missing the iron boost from current stability. They are no longer sufficient to uh, fit the observed data. So that 
could tell us, in fact, that looking at dwarf galaxies and trying to understand the, the metallicity plateau uh, we observe in the we observe, uh, this could tell us that uh, parent stability should have existed uh, in the past. Good. And let me finish in the in, in five minutes uh, about uh, when I wanted to present you another recent work where, in fact, we try to um, link dwarf galaxies with parameter magnetic field. Say differently, we, we demonstrate in this work that it is possible to um, get constraint on parameter magnetic field thanks to what we know about dwarf galaxies. I <clears throat> wanted to remind you that um, it's well known that magnetic fields exist everywhere in the universe. Um, however, understanding the amplitude remains still quite challenging. So I won't go into detail there, but one possibility could be to have seeds of magnetic field created during the uh, inflation period. So there are theoretical work that explain you how it works. I won't go into detail there again. Um, we, have a, we have existing constraint on the amplitude of those, um, the magnitude of these primordial, this primordial magnetic fields, but they are not super, super accurate. Anyway, the interest for us of these uh, magnetic fields, permanent magnetic field, is the following. Imagine that you have initial, well, the, the, <clears throat> the properties of your permanent magnetic fields is such that they fit, they are, they are following, uh, well, the power spectrum is a simple power law, which is what I wrote here. The, the, Power spectrum as a function of the wave number is simply a, a power law with some amplitude here, where you see this beta lambda parameter appearing, and some slope which we we'll call uh, NB. Okay, so if now this magnetic field exists um, before the amplification of the third dimension in our universe that leads to the formation of, of galaxies, uh, the fact that those magnetic field exists will perturb the final total of, uh, matter power spectrum. In fact, the idea is the following. You know that uh, to understand how the structure of world, you need to solve um, the coupling of the gravity with uh, hydrodynamics, right? Now, if, if, you, um, if you introduce magnetic field, we have a coupling of the magnetic field with the hydrodynamics which will then be coupled with the gravity. So you may directly, indirectly influence, magnetic field may indirectly influence um, the, the growth of, of the structure. For example, imagine that you have, well, in fact, the growth of the structure is nothing else than, than genes collapse. You know that if you have gas with strong pressure, this will prevent the, the, the collapse. If in addition, you have magnetic field, the magnetic field pressure will, of course, decrease the collapse. So this is how, this is why uh, we, we can understand that magnetic field may, may play an important role. Anyway, uh, what we want to know is what will be the impact of the magnetic field on the total matter for a spectrum. So this is the here a sketch of the total matter for a spectrum. Um, so you have P as a function of K. So this is a classical picture we have. And uh, this part here is the part which is well constrained by observation, like for example, Nyman and Forest, observation of large, large plate structure, BAO, and so on and so forth. This part, however, so at high case or so very small scale, is not constrained. And this is precisely there that if we assume a power law with some uh, B and N parameters, we will have a modification of the power spectrum. So depending on the on the value of your parameters, you have a bump with, with a variety of, of amplitude. And what is very interesting there is that this correspond, I mean, you can turn this K, the wave number, into uh, a dark halo mass. And the dark halo mass is exactly in the dwarf regime, so between few 10 to the 9 down to 10 to the 6. And this is where we link the bridge, I mean, the porous, the, the magnetic, parameter magnetic field with uh, dwarf galaxies. So uh, our idea was to simply re-simulate our model of dwarf galaxy, but now changing our cosmological initial conditions by including this perturbation to magnetic field. 
And the effects, for example, you see here, so that's dark matter on the simulations. This is the our entire box, 304 megaparsecs. And we can focus for them here on this dwarf galaxy, and you have the zoom of it here. This is the unperturbed case, but now you see the the what is induced by the perturbation, and you see, for example, that the constraint, in some cases, the concentration of the dwarf or the Will be larger, or in other cases, you will have plenty of small satellites, small halo, um, boost the number of, of halo around uh, your dwarf galaxies. Okay, <clears throat> now more interesting is what will be the impact in terms of observables. What will be the impact on the luminosity and the velocity dispersion on observed quantities? So, what we need is to, to put the, the product simulations now on these scaling relations. You have here the luminosity as a function of the luminosity of the, the velocity dispersion. And we see that in some cases, so it's a bit a busy plot, but in some cases, in extreme cases, I would say, you have a model that deviates from the relation. This is more striking here, where you have the metallicity as a function of the luminosity. And you see that in some cases, you strongly over predict the metallicity of the system. And this is due to the fact that there are cases where you strongly boost. The, the star formation because the, the, the dark halo is slightly denser. By the way, if you, I show you that in some cases, you not only boost the star formation, but you boost also the, the number of small satellites. <clears throat> and so, of course, there will be, it could be a direct impact on the number of dwarf satellites observed in the uh, Milky Way. And this is illustrated in, in this two plot model that I, well, this two plot I showed you before. But there, in addition to the lambda CDM model, you have this perturbed model. You see that are, there are cases like this uh, cyan one here, or this purple one here, that very strongly over predict the number of satellites that should exist in, around the Milky Way. So we can simply rule out this model, which definitely have a, a two to strong uh, permanent magnetic amplitude. We can play the same role looking at the realization of the universe. Um, these are two plots that show the expected um, neutral fraction of uh, hydrogen gas as a function of the redshift. The redshift goes from low redshift to high redshift from, right, from left to right. Yeah? And those uh, points here are observations. Uh, and we see that the majority of our models are more or less in agreement with uh, these uh, hydrogen fraction. However, there are some cases which very strongly deviate. And that's the one where, indeed, the star formation inside the dwarf is boosted, or we have too many of those, those dwarfs, which directly impact the way the, the universe reacts. So again, we can rule out um, some parameters describing the um, the permanent magnetic field. So um, I think it's it's interesting to see that very indirectly dwarf galaxies help us to constrain permanent magnetic fields. So let me reach now to my conclusions. Um, so I think I convinced you that uh, lambda CDM models leads to the formation of nice um, dwarf galaxies, which uh, nicely reproduce scaling relations, they not only reproduce scaling relations, but they are in agreement with many details, properties we observe in dwarf galaxies, uh, velocity dispersion profile, abundances, metallistic gradients, star population, product rotation, and so on and so forth. There are still remaining challenges, uh, like, for example, uh, how can we understand peculiar features, well, very peculiar star formation histories in Carina and, and Fornax, and how can we understand the existence of, of a faint gas-rich gas system like uh, EOP and EOT? And finally, uh, I hope I convince you that maybe we can link, we can use dwarf galaxies to better understand the nature of the first stars, pop three stars. Uh, it seems that we need an addition of, of iron to um, fit the metallicity plateau which is observed, and this, uh, this increased uh, quantity of, of iron could be provided by a very massive star for instability. And finally, I, uh, we've seen that dwarf galaxies may also be used to constrain 
additional physics in the lambda CDN universe, like for example, the existence of permanent magnetic fields, um, in which in some cases, if, it, if they exist, will lead to dwarf galaxies that will fully realize the universe much earlier than what is observed. Right? So in summary, I hope uh, you are now convinced that uh, dwarf galaxies are super powerful tools to study our universe. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Yves. Thank you, Yves. Uh, um, it was a very interesting talk. I, as usual, I have a lot of uh, questions that probably I will need to send you uh, through email because we will have no time to discuss all, all of them. Because also, uh, I want first to uh, give the opportunity to the audience to, to uh, make the questions. So the people in the audience, um, if you want, just uh, raise your hand. You can start uh, asking your questions. And also, please, first say your name and your institution. Thank you. Uh, Jorge, I think you, you have a question. Uh, it's me? Uh, yeah, no. I'll I saw you with a microphone open, so I yeah, I, I want to make a question. So it's it's just fine. I don't know why I don't have the I have a problem with the video. It doesn't want to show. I mean to to start. Well, I, I'm not gonna use it. So uh, Jorge Sanchez Almeida from the IAC, and I mean it, it was a I mean a very broad uh, review of of the field, and really I have all, many uh, questions and comments, but. Uh, the main one, uh, this is the one that we're going to make, uh, had to do with the, the global scaling relations that you showed uh, from your uh, dwarf galaxy. So uh, could you show us the geograph? Uh, sure, sure. The um, yeah, for this one. Uh, no, with, with the, uh, actually it's the relation between size and luminosity, or size and Oh, luminosity. good, good, good. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah, that one. Okay, so uh, the question is uh, that uh, you didn't comment on that, but uh, it's kind of striking that the size of the galaxy don't depend on the luminosity at all, even in the low uh, luminosity end. And, and the question is uh, whether you think that this is connected with the uh, forecast problem. And, and if that is the case, then uh, I imagine that when you go to very, very low luminosities, you never have enough energy to remove the, the core. It doesn't seem to be the case in your, in your uh, goals. So you could, could you comment on this relation? Why is it flat and uh, why it doesn't kind of drop the size when you go to very, very low masses? Where yeah, this, 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 energy to, to remove the, the core. This is, an, the this is a very, very interesting question. And I could, I hope I, don't. well, can, there is a lot of, of, of things to say there. Um, the first thing is that we had initially some difficulties in obtaining this relation. Well, maybe first, um, a comment on the, on the observation themselves. In fact, I'm sorry, but what I didn't put here, so you see that the, the relation stop at 10 to the 5, just at the limit of the ultra-faint dwarf. If you continue, if you look at, at what people found those last years, you see that the, the, the decreasing, when well, the relation is, is clear, so it means there is a net decrease here with um, very faint systems reaching few tenths of parsec, right? So they are really compact. So I'm, I'm personally, I mean, if we believe observers, there is a clear um, relation there. It, it's looked quite flat here. I'm, I'm not sure, well, uh, I'm not sure this couldn't be just a bias because we missed the, this part there. Okay, that, that's the first one I wanted to make. Then, uh, concerning the connection between the simulation and the observations, um, we are not completely happy with uh, producing this relation. You see, for example, that, well, indeed, it, it's pretty flat. Uh, so that's fine because uh, at this level, the, the relation seems to be flat, but we are unable to, to reproduce those, those points here. Uh, and it's very difficult for us to make points move down here, so having more compact objects. And by studying the details, uh, by, by studying this problem in detail, what we found is that there is a numeric, we can suffer from a numerical problem. In fact, um, it's a simple problem. Our stellar particles 
have a mass which is different than the mass of the dark particles. And so um, we've seen that there is a spurious heating. We are suffering some, some collision between stellar particles and the halo. So we are transferring energy from the halo to the stellar particles. And then it, it makes the system uh, inflate a little bit. Then we are probably, there is probably an issue with the, the resolution. We are not the only one which are predicting, um, uh, well, we have difficulties to, to have more compact system. There was a, a paper from the industry team two weeks ago, uh, which were suffering from the exact same problem. Then to, answer, to, to connect with the, 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 the cusp and the core, so this is true indeed that the, usually for this very faint system, the, well, the, the feedback energy is not sufficient to turn anything into a core, to, to turn a, a cusp into a core. Well, I cannot tell you exactly, well, I, I, I'm, I'm arguing um, based on, on work that has been submitted. I, I didn't work myself on, on this problem because uh, it's only very recently that we strongly increase the, the relation and we should address this, this problem at the, at the level of the infrared. But, but it, naively, I think it will be quite clear that there is no, uh, not enough energy to, to do that. Um, yes, uh, did I answer correctly or? Yeah, yeah, I mean, more than enough. Uh, and if I have additional questions for you, I will send you an email. Good. You can proceed, Jorge, if you want it, um, because I see that there is no other people. I, well, I have another, actually, this is a comment. Uh, it's about one of the challenges that you pointed out. For you, it's kind of surprising that uh, dwarfs have gas. But, but this I don't understand at all, because you, 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 you expect to continue gas accretion, cosmological gas accretion. Um, good point, good point, but I don't think so. I mean, keep in mind that this, so, those dwarf galaxies are living in very small halos. So the typical mass, so they're, they're well, different authors are not, they, they don't completely agree, but the typical halo mass, the real mass, is just above 10 to the nine, probably something like this. And this, this is in terms of temperature, this is, if you turn that in terms of temperature, it's 10 to the four. So if you have, um, well, Say differently, um, if you have gas, well, of course, if you have gas which is super cold, which is much lower than 10 to the 4, you, you may be able to accrete um, and to feed the dwarf, absolutely. Uh, and fortunately, well, uh, sorry, on, on the contrary, if, if it is quite warm, and we've seen that, in fact, the majority of the gas is heated by the UV background, it, it is too hot and it can no longer be accreted. Say differently, it has a, a specific energy which is too large. So, um, well, maybe, but, well, what, what we see from our simulation is that uh, around these dwarf galaxies, the, the, the gas is, is heated and all clumps, all tiny clumps of coal gas will, be, will evaporate. So there is no longer a way to accrete any coal gas. That's, that's something, so maybe we are suffering from a uh, numerical problem. I mean, a, a lack of resolution, which uh, for some reason prevent us to have pockets of gas which are super cold. That's maybe something we, we need to, to test uh, indeed. But uh, no, it's, uh, to me, it's absolutely not obvious that we can accrete anything in this, this halo. Because the, the, the attraction, say differently, the attraction is very low. Okay, um, the only comment uh, is that I think that in the simulations, you don't have the uh, resolution and the cooling uh, biases that are required to resolve the gas in the intergalactic medium and to, to really rule out that the gas has to be hotter than 10 to the 4 all the time, everywhere. So yep. probably you're going you to have everything on the coast. I mean, you, you mentioned three galaxies, but there are really hundreds of them known, which are uh, low mass and they are very, very gas rich. Yeah. So, so, well, uh, I think uh, simulations are still not good enough 
to really uh, use the argument that you are using? In fact, well, um, I, 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 I agree. This is a very interesting point. Uh, so what we, indeed, imagine that we have access to a much higher resolution. Um, indeed, we will be able to solve, well, to, to resolve this small clump of gas, uh, even to the point where, well, by the way, this is what we are doing. We, we are reaching density where gas should be uh, self-shielded against the UV background. Um, so, but imagine that for some reason, there are still plenty of, of pocket of, of cold gas that remains. Uh, what I, the problem I see is that uh, this, well, usually the spike of gas should be related to dark halos. I mean, this is how the, the dwarf galaxy forms. So we should find them in dark halos and, and then you will form additional satellites in some sense. So uh, we should suffer again the mystic satellite problem, say differently. So the, the, what we should be able to, to do is to to decorate the, the gas to having to having gas which is no longer tied to dark halo uh, around our galaxy, and then this one could then be accreted. I agree with that. But, uh, okay, I mean, fair enough. So. Thank you, Jorge. We have another question by uh, Miriam Garcia. Uh, Hi. Hi. So, uh, I'm Miriam Garcia from the Center of Astrobiology in Madrid. And uh, I became interested in dwarf galaxies because we are working on massive stars with very, very poor metal content. Mm -hmm. and, and that's related uh, to my question, uh, because in this very same slide, you commented that uh, the stars in the middle of the plane uh, uh, stopped forming stars a long time ago. But we know that at least uh, a couple of them, sextants A, uh, sextants B, A, 16, 13, and also W and uh, M have massive stars. So that means uh, they form stars very recently. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. And also, uh, I'm also very curious about uh, the role of present day massive stars in all these studies, uh, because we know feedback is important, but uh, they are not so numerous. So, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't hear uh, where your question. So your question, you, you're talking about indeed the existence of Dwarf galaxies that have an extended star formation history, and of of course forming stars up to very recently. You mentioned WNM. This is indeed the case. Yeah. Uh, uh, so we expect massive stars to exist there, but I didn't get the the point, the the, the question. That stood in uh, when you were showing this slide that stars in the middle of the of the plane of the uh, velocity dispersion with luminosity. I understood that uh, stars in the middle of these planes were not forming stars anymore. Yes, indeed, but that, that's that. Then um, this, is, this is the problem we just discussed: the fact that our model predicts that uh, all faint. I can show you the yeah. All faint systems, so with luminosity less than 10 to the 6, are predicted to be quenched systems. So indeed, uh, the, the fact that we observe um, systems with rather low luminosity, but still forming stars, is for, for me an issue. And um, yeah, so either we are missing, we are lacking resolution, and we are lacking the reaccretion of coal gas, that could be one possibility, or um, Another possibility is that, of course, in this model, we one very important parameter, which is has a deep impact, is the UV background trend we assume, and uh, we as, we assume it to be um, constantly rare, so completely homogeneous. But this is probably not uh, true. For example, we could imagine that the the this UV this UV heating will be much stronger around massive galaxies because, of course, you, the photons are, could be, the ionizing photon could be dominated by the host, and slightly further out, it drops. And there, I mean, the galaxy that form in the outskirts of the Milky Way, for example, could be the region where the reionization uh, occurs much later and they could be less affected. So there is also this, this, this um, 
um, parameters that could play a role. Okay, and uh, I'm sorry if I ask many questions because this is a bit new to me, but uh, when you speak of uh, UV background in, in these uh, galaxies at the present day, what would be their source, the, the, the main galaxy uh, which they are uh, uh, satellites of, or, or in a UV background generated by their own massive stars? No, okay, okay. Uh, okay, I used the uh, terminal well. This is good that you asked the question because I, I, I used the term um, imagining that everybody was aware of that. So um, when, when we talk about UV backgrounds, this means the cosmological UV background. So imagine that you, you take into account all the stars, galaxy that forms at a given time, they will all um, eject, well, um, generate ionizing photons and this creates everywhere in the universe, and this creates this UV background. So this is what usually people that uh, compute the evolution of the galaxy takes into account, nothing else. Now, of course, if you want to be much more accurate, what you need, what we should take is to take into account the fact that every star, of course, produce um, ionizing photons, and then we should uh, look at how the, the, the photons interact with the the ISM and, and so on and so forth. But this is, so this is something people are doing now. There are code that are able to do that. Um, <clears throat> but this is really, really CPU demanding. So it's called, well, this is a, a radiative transfer, in fact. Yeah. So this is not taking into account. And uh, yeah, that's, it's good that you raised this point because it could be possible that, um, um, in fact, we, we are, because we are assuming this very simple, simplistic UV background, we are um, biased in some, in some sense. So okay. of course, the best would be to have a full radiative transfer. This is on the pipeline, but it's uh, far from, from obvious. And, and this actually relates to my second original question, that what was the impact of uh, present-day massive stars on all the simulations you are making of, of 12 galaxies? But, uh, it seems that uh, feedback is not input yet, if I understand correctly. So um, for us, the only the only impact will be through the the energy, the supernova energy injection. That's all. Okay. Don't take into account ionizing ionizing photons. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. I need to one second. Ah. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so meanwhile, if somebody else has a, a question, please raise your hand. And don't worry. I have, uh, I have a question myself, very fast one, maybe, or, or maybe not, but I have two, but I will only make one. Um, it's related with the magnetic fields. How do we expect that the, the magnetic fields could play uh, an important role on, on keeping a budget of cold gas to, uh, uh, to lower redshift to more, more recent times, like being maybe a way to solve the problem with, uh, with uh, the, the amount of gas we observe at uh, low redshift or also uh, that the, this uh, star formation peak that we observe and is not observed in, in simulations. How can the pressure, the additional pressure by the magnetic fields in a very localized places in where the magnetic fields can be very strong solve this problem? Uh, by not allowing stars to form there, so keeping this gas for star formation for later star formation. So, uh, so what you mean by magnetic field is really the ma magnetic field which is tied to the ISM, and right because what I presented was just the effect of well, what I presented in my last part was just the effect of the magnetic field, the um, as it it impacts the the the, the total matter of spectrum. So. Um, I have to confess that I mean I I never run myself magneto hydrodynamic simulation, so um, I cannot really answer. Um, but well, as far as I've seen, the impact of of magnetic field on the star formation is not so so strong. So I don't expect it to be so as strong as, as well to be. Yeah, I Strong enough uh, in in dwarf galaxies, and in, in fact, I don't really understand how it could help to keep this this gas. 
Uh, it would prevent, for example, it, it's easier to understand that it could prevent fragmentations. So it, it will, of course, have a role in the in in the the, the formation well, the, of, of IMF on the shape of IMF. But uh, I don't think it will prevent the gas to be blow out of a wave. I am not an expert on, on magnetic fields either, so I am not using them in simulations. So it was just a question that um, went to my, my mind at, at the last part of your talk. And by the other the, one very fast. Yeah, yeah sorry. So by the way, we, we have now playing a little bit with Ramses. So uh, the, the goal was to have uh, to reproduce more or less our dark galaxies, but now we Ramses. And you know, we can then switch on the uh, magneto. Happening, so maybe the answer will come soon. Good, perfect. And a very last one is uh, when you were showing the relation between the luminosity and the metallicity, and saying that basically in the simulations you have uh, this uh, very steep decline while in observations, no. Uh, I was wondering um, in simulations, you are not getting luminosity, you are getting basically mass. So you apply some mechanism to convert this mass to the luminosity, to observe the luminosity. And uh, this uh, from one side. From the other side, when you do observations, you get the metallicity from the, the lines you observe from the stars that are shining or from absorption from the gas. Um. And when you look for the, for, the, for the absorption, you are not looking to the very old metal poor stars because they, these are already dead and maybe they are void dwarfs. So, so it has some, maybe this is an observational bias. Maybe this, <clears throat> this is a bias due to the way you convert the simulations uh, mass to the to the luminosity. I don't know. Maybe both. Is this a real problem? Is not maybe a problem of observing or, or converting to the luminosities? Yes. <clears throat> so the first question. So indeed, we have stellar masses. Then it's not so difficult to turn those stellar masses into luminosity. So we simply use. Um, so we, we know the IMF, and there are then uh, codes, well, uh, tables, I would say tables, that tell you um, what should be the luminosity for a given uh, stellar mass. And so we are using the, the best this, this table. So basically, you, uh, there, there are people who are predicting for a population of stars what is the corresponding luminosity. And in addition, I would like to to stress that, I mean, we are talking about system that ceased to form stars 10, well, 12 billion years ago. So they are very, they are all very um, dominated by, by old stellar population. I mean, and uh, then the, the, the M over L is much easier to compute. Basically, it's nearly one. So you can see that uh, for one stellar, mass, you have nearly one solar luminosity. So, and again, keep in mind that everything is in log here. So if you, if you have a little bit of error, like for example, factor of two, it's nothing in this, in this plot. So I don't think this is an issue. And then related on the second question, yes. Um, so th there is no gas. The, again, we are talking about pre system, so there is no gas. So the only way to access the metallicity is through spectra. And this is really what is, uh, what we kept here. And uh, in addition, in this plot, well, well we, we keep only the point where the metallicity has been determined using high resolution spectra. So what you see here is, the, is a really accurate value. So this is the, this is the contribution of, uh, well, this is the iron as being determined inside stars through spectra. So this is super accurate. Then what could be, yeah, that the, they could be, we could suffer from additional bias, for example, it could be possible, but I, I show you that, that finding those ultra faint is super difficult. That, that's the first problem. And then, so, so what this is disentangling the, the stars that belong to the ultra faint with the one of the Milky Way or other object is, is difficult. So could, could we, could we uh, suffer from, a bias because we are missing for them the metal poster that could be that could exist in the outskirts, which is even more difficult to well 
the, the stars that are even more difficult to, to, to find. So that could be one possibility. So it means it would lower down this, this plateau. Uh, but the, the, the gradient that are observed, so the gradient that are observed in this ultra faint system is very small. Uh, it's debated, but it's very small. So even if you extend, uh, <clears throat> if you, you say, okay, let's extend the ultra faint to larger distance and imagine that we are missing the contribution of metal per star, I doubt it will change the plateau here. Nobody did. I mean, this, uh, we are never um, avoiding an observational bias, but yeah, I think it will. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you, Riz. Um, so if there is no additional question, uh, just uh, to thank you a lot for, for this very uh, nice and complete talk and uh, also for accepting to be one of the, the speakers in these uh, part of seminars. And hope to see you soon. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And for all the audience, um, thank you for coming. And uh, we will meet again next week with another talk that we, we will announce on, on Monday. Thank you, everybody, and have a nice uh, day and weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye.